tell us a little bit about yourself, about um, how it is that you're involved in uh, in the housing question here in Vancouver and what it is that you know about it. Hmm, interesting question. I guess I've sort of been an urban dweller for most of my life. I'm, I grew up around Greater Vancouver, but have lived in Vancouver for a good 20 years or so. And I actually think Vancouver is probably the most livable city in the world after all my travels. And that's not a coincidence. It's a it's a result of very good proactive planning policies that have allowed us to live, work, play in such a beautiful area. Well, Smart Growth BC is a provincial nonprofit organization. We work with communities around the province to uh, plan for growth in more sustainable ways. So a large component of Smart Growth is ensuring that that affordable housing is addressed and that each community has a range of affordable housing available. So what do you think the, the big challenge is facing affordability here in Vancouver? I mean, there's a lot of talk about it. It's in the front page of the newspaper again today, but how expensive it is to live here. What do you think the challenge is here in Vancouver for housing? I think the challenge is on several levels. One is providing enough affordable housing for for people with lower incomes who can't afford to buy or even rent their own place. So that's one level. So in that sense, we need to provide non-market housing, social housing, so that whole range of housing um, on that end. But we also, I think, are lacking a range of, of affordable housing, even for middle, um, middle class income earners. A lot of people with young families are starting to move, or not starting, a lot of people with a lot of, <coughs> let's try that again, a lot of young families tend to move out to our suburban communities because housing there is perceived to be cheaper than in Vancouver. Um, that's not taking into consideration the other expenses that they have to incur, usually a second car or, or the transportation expenses, but the housing itself is cheaper. And part of it is we don't have enough of a range of, of uh, for example, three-bedroom townhouses that might suit a young family or... Um, or duplexes or a range of different types of housing that will suit young families. They tend to be supplied more in the suburbs, so that's where people are, are moving to, yet they're, yet they're still working in Vancouver or working in a different suburb. So the, the suburban homes, I mean, the cost issue, the price issue is obviously one very compelling reason, but uh, people are also uh, interested in moving there because they like the space and they like the, uh, uh, the distance between neighbors, among other things. Uh, I mean, there's very compelling reasons uh, for uh, certain people to, to live in those suburban neighborhoods. Do you think, uh, and, uh, but I think the crux of the problem is that it's just not sustainable in the long run. I mean, how do you approach that? And, we, and the smart growth approach isn't the anti-suburb. We're not saying that suburbs are wrong or that um, the suburban developments are are wrong. It's just that they can be done in a much better way. So yes, people do like single family homes and they like a, a yard and space for their kids to play and that's perfectly legitimate. <clears throat> Some of the things we try to promote to make it more sustainable is have building smaller lots so that each each foot the footprint of each home takes up less space. They're closer together and therefore you can increase the density of a neighborhood. Once you increase the density, all these other um, amenities, amenities can follow. For example, once we get higher densities, it's more uh, economically feasible to provide a good transit system for these families, especially for kids who can take the bus instead of having to depend on their parents as chauffeurs to drive them around everywhere. So, but if density is the real question, I mean, you could achieve that here in Vancouver, in these large, uh, large part of Vancouver is this uh, single family. Um, RS zone, and uh, a lot of those at that point, then a lot of the attractive things that you could find in the suburbs, you could also find here in the city. The city of Vancouver has just recently, in March, passed uh, passed the bylaw that allows le secondary suites to be legal in all single-family zoning across the city. So we think that's a very progressive measure. Um, in fact, about I think about 70 percent of of the homes right now are in single family zones. However, most of them already have secondary suites that aren't legal. So um, having passed that bylaw, that's a very progressive measure. That's an incentive, especially for new developments, to uh, allow uh, legal secondary suites. And it's a market incentive that will help first time home, home buyers um, 
to be able to purchase a home if they can rent out their suite legally, and it provides a range of affordable housing um, in those secondary suites. So, yes, we have lots of room in Vancouver to increase density, provide lots more housing for people without really changing the neighborhood characteristic. I think one fear that people have about change is um, just fear, just the fear of change and fear of the unknown and maybe the rate of change. So I think we can accommodate a lot more uh, people and increase our, our density substantially in these single family homes without changing the neighborhood characteristic, without even making the neighborhood look different by, um, by providing secondary suites, maybe a coach house in the backyard and, and things like that. And what do you think the impact of that kind of infill would be on a neighborhood? If I was a neighbor living there, hearing about these changes that are happening and might be coming, uh, I mean, what do you, what changes do you think that that kind of infill brings to to a single family neighborhood? I think it's really important to get the neighborhood involved in the planning from from the very beginning. So if people are all talking about similar goals and visions together, and if people can start visualizing what their family situations would be. Right now, maybe they're living in a single family neighborhood, but as they age or as their parents age, and getting people to think about, well, I still want to have my parents living in the same neighborhood, and I want to have my kids growing up and being able to buy a house in the same neighborhood. And you have to start addressing the need for a complete range of housing. So we really promote a range of housing types and affordabilities and, and uh, and price ranges within the same neighborhood as well as within the same street. So, you know, as my parents age, they could stay in the neighborhood. Maybe there would be a seniors housing um, complex down the street, and then my kids could buy a house for the first time on the other street close by. Now, when you contrast that to a uh, to suburban type dwellings, I mean, um, is it also possible to achieve similar things in suburban situation? Oh, it's. I think it's totally possible. Probably it takes more time because what we need to do is to increase the density a bit and also mix the uses. The, the problem with a lot of suburban developments that are, tend to be a little more sprawling is that they're all single use. So residential areas are separated from commercial and retail and the only way people can get around is having to is to have to drive from one place to another. So to make suburban areas a little more smart growth we need to mix the uses so that each neighborhood you have a mixture of housing, retail. People can live, work, and shop pretty much in the same neighborhood. So does transit affect how density can, uh, can happen in a neighborhood? I think transit planning and land use planning and planning for housing all has to be integrated together. So even though um, we can plan for transit-oriented developments, so we can put in a rapid transit line, for example, and then build housing and commercial and retail around it. That's one way of doing it. Um, but the other way is just intensifying our existing uses, uh, intensifying and densifying our existing neighborhoods so it becomes more feasible to provide better transit systems. Vancouver has a pretty good transit system because in most areas we have sufficient, sufficient density and it makes it feasible to provide good transit, but a lot of our suburban neighborhoods don't have the density and we can't afford to supply transit. So it's sort of a chicken and egg thing. There's not enough transit supply, so not enough people take it. So once we can densify and intensify the land use, then we can provide a better transit system. Do you feel that uh, we can, that our neighborhoods currently can be more green uh, in terms of the housing structures we have there? Do you feel that there's uh, an opportunity for a lot of change there or, or not? Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity for making our housing developments, our neighborhoods and our cities more green. I think we have the technology. Um, the pricing is still uh, is still difficult to deal with because some of the technologies are still more expensive, but often not much more. The other thing about density is that once we achieve enough density, it makes um, implementing these technologies much more economically uh, feasible. So the other link that needs to be made more around the green building uh, movement and affordable housing is that the more um, sustainable and green technologies we incorporate into any housing development, the, the more the savings should come back and therefore we should make it more affordable for rental housing, especially for the, the non-market housing. So I'd like to see more of the integration between the green building technology and non-market housing.
Well, where do people go if they want to know more about uh, uh, green building? What do, you, uh, what do you recommend for if somebody is interested in uh, making their own place greener or doing a renovation or a redesign or something? Any, uh, anything you recommend where people could look at? I'll just suggest looking up the Architectural Institute of BC website. We'll probably have some stuff. If you look up LEED, L-E-E-D, um, on the website, that will get you to the Le Leadership in Environmental Energy Design website. Um, BC is actually standardizing their own LEED standards for our province because it's been adopted from the states. And um, there are some developers now really coming on board doing green development. So I can think of a couple of ex examples of really good infill developments using green building technology. One is on West 11th and Yukon, and it was a, an infill redevelopment from a single family home to four, uh, four suites, three in the main building and a coach house, and then another one called Coos Corner in, uh, in Strathcona, which was a redevelopment from an old garage into six condo units and using pretty green technology. So different developers are starting to embrace green building technologies, partly because it's the thing to do, move into the sustainability field, but also they're realizing that the demand is starting to be there. As the public uh, perception and understanding shifts, there is a greater demand for, for green building and more environmentally sustainable design. Do you think the public uh, is really ready for that kind of change? I think the public is starting to move that way. Um, in Vancouver, we're pretty lucky. We're, we seem to be the leaders in Canada, for sure, on green building and environmentally sustainable uh, development and, and design. And I think, um, I think the public is moving there. They're very environmentally conscious. A lot of people who live in Vancouver tend to be more environmentally and socially conscious probably than many parts of Canada. So they are starting to look for these um, value-added assets when they buy. And, you know, let me take a bit broader. Do you think people are willing, uh, the public is really ready to move to higher density neighborhoods as well? I think people are recognizing the, the huge benefits of living in compact, complete communities where they can walk to what they need to, to do, where there's a sense of vibrancy. One thing about a lot of our suburban development patterns is that every suburb and every um, every suburb looks the same, or every strip a strip highway looks the same. You don't know which city or neighborhood you're in because they all look the same as each other. But if you live in a more compact um, neighborhood where it's got a very vibrant sense of place, you know exactly where you are, you're proud to be part of that community, and you, there's a lot of social capital built. People know each other, people love um, being connected to that neighborhood. And I think there's, there's a gradual movement in understanding that, yeah, that's where we want to be, that's where we want to grow, we, we want to raise our kids. So even some of the newer developments now in the more traditional suburban neighborhoods are starting to become more new urbanist or smart growth where the um, where they're more compact and it's mixed use, so there's a set of townhouses integrated with a, a retail center or, so, or something like that. And I see Smart Growth is working on some uh, big uh, projects such as, I think it's Pitt Meadows? Maple Ridge. Uh, Maple Ridge, <coughs> is that where you, uh, you're doing a project there? Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what that uh, is all about? It, um, Smart Growth BC, in partnership with the UBC Sustainable Communities Program and the Real Estate Institute of BC, launched a program called Smart Growth on the Ground. And this is a pilot project at this point. We're working with three communities over the next three years. And our first community is Maple Ridge, so we started working with them last fall. And the project is a redevelopment of 500 acres, um, including their downtown core, totally according to Smart Growth principles. So. We're, we're working with the municipality and the community to um, implement a neighborhood concept plan following smart growth principles. Inside Vancouver now, in some of these single family districts, is there, uh, is there room to implement the smart growth principles? I think Vancouver as a city has, is pretty good in terms of smart growth. It's, it meets a lot of the smart growth principles. For example, um, Trans, it's, it, transit is accessible within usually a five-minute walk of most homes, um, and there is 
there is a fairly good range of housing in many neighborhoods, although not all. But we can we can still do much better. Or we can still do much more in Vancouver to to achieve more smart growth. So that is including a better range of housing um, and a range of housing uh, housing prices um, because it is pretty expensive to rent or buy in Vancouver. Um, we can use some of the new technologies to retrofit a lot of our existing um, residential and commercial buildings. A lot, for example, treating stormwater differently. Um, and then transportation, of course. Even though transit is pretty good in many neighborhoods, once you go to some of the, um, the neighborhoods lying further away from downtown Vancouver, transit isn't so good. And again, that's an issue of density. We don't have enough density there to warrant a, a, a more efficient transit system. Do you think there's a problem in terms of the amount of housing available for lower income families? And I'm really more interested in the barriers to, uh, that are preventing, uh, from your point of view, prevent that kind of uh, development in the income sector. Yes, I think Vancouver definitely lacks enough housing for lower income people. Um, the problem is it's, it's difficult for developers to provide that type of housing it's, uh, for them to make it affordable to produce that type of housing. Um, historically, we've really depended on government funding and government subsidies for non-market and social housing, but both federal and provincial government have pulled out of that affordable housing market uh, several years ago, and without it, we've had a real stall in, in developing um, non-market housing projects. I think um, the federal government is looking at getting back into, into it, and the provincial government is putting trickles of money back into it, but we really need some partnerships between government um, and developers to provide the, the incentives um, to provide more affordable housing. The city of Vancouver has done some, some good things around it. They've, they've got all kinds of financial and non-financial incentives in place for developers to provide affordable housing. So we're moving in the right direction, but it's not, not quite enough. So how do you make density livable? I think a lot of people are are scared of density or, or densification in their neighborhood because they equate density with with um, tenement housing or high rises and something that they don't want to be part of. But I think Vancouver has done a pretty good job of densifying neighborhoods and the move to put a lot of residential in the downtown core was really smart. And we've created a world-class city where it's very high density, one of the highest density cities in North America, but very livable. And that's a mixture of, of urban design, good urban design and aesthetics, but largely because of the open space that, that has been made available as well. So the city has used lots of, of um, lots of, so, okay, the city has used a lot of strategies such as density bonusing. So the developers are allowed to build a little more densely here, but they have to provide or pres preserve an area f for green space. So all the new developments along north, the North Shore of Falls Creek and Coal Harbor, for example, are very high density but still very livable because there's just so much open space that people can can um, enjoy and and see from from their windows, and that makes a, a big difference. We do have to be cautious that. We, we don't let lose sight of the commercial downtown and don't just only build for residential because we don't want the re reverse commute happening, that everybody's living downtown and then commuting outside of Vancouver. So we have to ensure that there's still that mixture of housing and, and work, business, retail, commercial, to make it um, really livable too. So uh, is it density, I mean, so you can make density uh, livable, but... Uh, some people are uh, are concerned about um, uh, safety and security in their uh, in their neighborhoods. When you go from a traditional single-family neighborhood to uh, to having a number of secondary suites and infill, which uh, where the tenants are a little more transient um, and it's not the same single-family as used to live there, uh, people were some people are you know rightly uh, concerned that that might change their neighborhood. Does, does smart growth uh, deal with the security and the, the safety principles that people are always put as a top priority for their neighborhood? We don't deal directly with safety and security. However, um, the smart growth principles of compact 
complete design, com compact urban design, I think really fosters a sense of creative cre uh, of safety because the more people are around, the more the sense of safety. Um, all the research has shown that there isn't any more crime in higher density neighborhoods than in the lower density suburbs. It's just a per it's a perception, and a lot of research has shown is that um, more eyes on the street, the more the more safe it is, especially for your kids kids um, playing around on the street. And there's lots of different senses of safety as well. For example, we have a, a way higher incidence of, of people driving their kids everywhere now. Kids are being driven to school, to soccer practice, everywhere. They're not allowed to walk or cycle by themselves because of the safety issue. But it's not just safety from other people. It's safety from car traffic. If there was if we, everybody lived in more compact, walkable neighborhoods, it'd be a lot easier to allow your kids to walk somewhere a few blocks away because there's everybody else on the street uh, and not as much traffic. So the whole safety issue is largely a perceived thing. I mean, there is some, some reality to it, but um, I think we can address a lot of the safety issues through urban design. There was one thing about housing in Vancouver that you thought was a top priority that needed to change, that, that was changing, and should continue to change. Uh, can you capture that for us? I think one thing that Vancouver could do as a city, as a whole, is to to intensify existing single-family homes and start looking at ways of, without changing the neighborhood character, of adding extra suites. So secondary suites, suites co coach houses, building townhouses on a single-family lot, for example. Um, I live in the east end of Vancouver, and most most of the lots are single family or are, are single family zoned, but um, a lot of within each street there's a lot of duplexes that totally look like single family homes, or even fourplexes that look like a single family home. And I think by having that range of housing, we can um, we can we can densify without changing the neighborhood characteristic at all. And um, one thing that's really important in Vancouver is keeping our heritage style housing that's so prevalent. And if we can keep that and densify by, by adding suites, I think we can do a lot to provide more housing.